All right, getting back in here on Diamond Conversation, spending a beautiful Tuesday afternoon with somebody who's on the other side of the country from me, but I'm going to welcome in my second straight guest from the wonderful state of Nevada as I welcome in former <laughs> Major League outfielder, the one and only Chad Hermanson. Mr. Hermanson, thank you so much for joining me today. You bet, Ian. How's it going, man? Oh, it's doing uh, very wonderful today here in Virginia. The last time I spoke with somebody in Nevada was uh, the Mad Dog, Mr. Madlock yeah. out there. So we're talking a little uh, a little Pittsburgh Pirate uh lineage a few a few decades before you but uh nonetheless two pirates in a row for me no that's all yeah i i see that i see bill i, I bill mad dog what are you to call him right i <laughs> he, he uh he works at the facility that i i take my kid to just right down the street so i see bill all the time nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Great conversation. I could listen to him tell stories all day. Those uh, those war stories of a bygone era. <laughs> so it's uh, very cool to catch up with the Mad Dog, but really cool to have you on today, too, man. I appreciate the time. Yeah, no doubt. I, I, I certainly have the time. I, I've been doing some things myself with what you're doing. And so it's it, I guess this is a perfect time to try to get a hold of people. That's for sure. It, it really is, but I'm flipping the script on you because I'm putting you back in the interview each yeah. chair. Yeah, I, I'm in the I'm, interviewer. I'm coming in blind, so absolutely. <laughs> so let's start. Let's actually let's start there. So you you started doing videos via YouTube interviews with people around the, the baseball industry, some friends of yours from your playing days. Kind of how'd that come about? Was it something that popped up because we have all this time on our hands now, or was it something you had been planning? And you know, and, and let's talk about that right out of the gate. Yeah, no, it was, it was a little bit, basically what I've done is I, I took a look at my career. Um, I took a look at what I do now as a scout and having a, just a lot of interaction with, with kids, right, in high school and in college. And everyone talks about the mental game and, and all they do is talk about it, but nobody's really doing anything about it. And so I started to see a pattern in Major League Baseball where – even front offices are starting to see like, hey, the, the mental game is important, but are, are we actually going to do something about it? So major league teams started to hire mental skills coaches, right? And and there's a difference between, say, a psychologist and a mental skills coach or a performance coach. And I'm like, God, that's something I've always been interested in. Because if you have a passion for helping people, it just fit. And I was like, dude, like that's I would love to do that because I, I have four kids. They're now 19. I have one son is 17 and then two other girls, 14 and 11. And even in just in life and just what they're going through daily, like you can tell where their mindset is at by the way they talk, by the way their body language is, just kind of how they interact with people. So as I, there's, there's got to be something I can do here. So one, one thing that kind of put me over the top in a sense of I had a, a kind of a conversation with my son. My son was struggling. This was he was a sophomore in high school last year and he was just having some struggles. He was, he's an outfielder. He's a big kid. He started varsity every, every day since his freshman year. And he was struggling with the bat and he came to me. He's like, dad, you know, this is while I'm scouting during spring. He came to me and he's like, dad, I'm, I'm kind of struggling a little bit. I need some help. And so I took him to the cage, did some work. We kind of, I wanted him to kind of try to figure it out himself a little bit on what, you know, mechanically, but it, it wasn't really necessarily mechanics. I could, it was his mindset and he was just really beating himself up had poor self-talk and kind of had a somewhat of a, we, he didn't have a great session. You could say we got in the car, we sat down in the car and he kind of, he got really emotional and like basically kind of came out and said, dad, you know, I, I'm really struggling here. Like I am, I'm trying to, we actually happen to go to the same high school. So oh, wow. <laughs> he, he obviously, but you know, he's my kid. He knows my first round pig, big league player, all these type of things. So in a nutshell, he was trying to live up to some expectations right. and it was a lot of pressure for him. Right. So oh, as absolutely. he kind of, yeah, as he came out to me and kind of said, Hey, this is what I'm going through. Like essentially I need some help. So we started to kind of work on th some things mentally and I started to kind of notice as I would talk to his buddies, I would talk to, I help with a scout team in the fall. And once you start to really get to know kids and they start to trust you, they start to open up, right? And they start to let you know, this is what I'm going through. You know, is there any way you can help me? And so I spent this whole past off season, you know, from a, the scouting season kind of is pretty much 10 months out of the year now because I, I, I scout. 
And so I was like, I'm going to put something together. And, and, and to answer your question and get to this point is I created a course um, that it works on the mental game. And it also is a personal development course. So what I've done with that is I created a video. I, I pick a topic. I go through the topic, teach the topic. And then I put a kind of a five question quiz afterwards. Like here's some very basic questions. Go ahead and answer these. I give a PDF workbook. And then these kids, they're able to work with me and start asking me questions and start. To, so essentially, I'm their their online mental skills coach. And so that that's how I started to develop this. And it's a it's a work in progress, but the course is pretty much complete. And I, I wanted to kind of start to because people didn't really if they don't know me, my background, who I am. I'm giving them a, a chance to have a to sign up for a free course. Right. Go go through a couple of videos. Okay, what what is chat teaching here? What is this all about? And they get to see how I teach. And then at the end of it, of course, I offer the course. But yeah, it's just something to where kids kids need help. And a lot of times they're not willing to admit it until you start to kind of they can trust you. You know you can make them better. And and I think parents, you know, I'm seeing the parents are really they're they're kind of more excited at first because they know how important it is for the kid. Right. They're like, dude, my kid needs this. Right. He's he's his self-talk is horrible. This is horrible. And so they, they know that, you know, the whole idea is to build their confidence and their self-esteem through this whole thing. Yeah, it's really cool to see the programs that you put together and how you can give kids this access now to really d dig deep into that mental aspect of the game. I mean, I remember going to camps as a kid and it was really it was. 200 kids in an auditorium and this station was ground balls and this one was fly balls and this was this and you got you're on your merry way now it's a little different where you can get that one-on-one -on -one instruction really go home and study it and and it's really cool to see the the actual the personal take that you have in it and and how you really reach out and do give all these instructions with all the means that you were just saying it's uh, it's very cool and it's quite innovative for this day and age yeah, I well, and, I, and the thoughts that came to me were, you know, if I'm scouting, if I'm scouting 10 months out of the year, I'm on the road a lot, right? Going back and forth. Then you see what YouTube is doing. And, and all my videos, I, it's kind of two separate things to answer your question earlier about the YouTube videos. So as the pandemic started, you know, and now we're just stuck in our homes, I was like, people are doing podcasts, people are doing this. I'm like, I should just start talking to players about the mental game. Number one, let, allow them to share their story because everyone's story is unique, you know, and what they're going through. And then two, they have something in, within their game and they can provide some value to young kids and even parents right. about the game. You know, whether it's about pitching, hitting, defense, all these things, that there's a mindset that you got to have to go out and be successful. And all of these, this mindset that you put into it, it's someday the game is going to be over with, right? So they right. have to be able to take those things they learn into life, into their jobs, and into their careers. But through each conversation on the YouTube channel, and it's mental health, uh, mental edge health. Uh, I don't want to sell you short. It's mental. It's, it's <laughs> tongue twister. You want to give it out there before I get yeah. to my question? Yeah, it's. it's I, I came up with mental edge training coach. That's it. I'm going to say mental health training <laughs> coach, but I didn't want to screw it up. But the cool part is, is seeing you talk to other ball players, other coaches, and, and almost getting their philosophies and seeing what helped them and how they even help with who they're training. And a lot, a lot of instances, it's some of their own kids or other teams that they work with and, and hearing stories of guys like David Risky and Craig Wilson and Jack Wilson and kind of like not only their journey, but then also like what they're doing with teaching their respective people. Everybody's got a different approach, but it all kind of comes back to your philosophy of what you're trying to put over. So I really find the conversations to be cool because you guys end up really bouncing stuff off one another and, and kind of digging deep that way. You know what I mean? That's the whole idea. Yeah. Cause I mean, you can talk about, you know, a particular subject with a player and Hey, let's talk about this. Cause this happened in your career and really dive into like, dude, what were you thinking? And in regards to let's open up about it, let's talk about it rather than kind of giving these surface answers. And, you know, it, so it's just a lot of it's a lot of fun. Uh, people love to tell their stories and we, we try to laugh just like, you know, we're having kind of a lighthearted conversation. And, and but just allowing people to start sharing, because I might say something that a kid could be like, oh, yeah, that totally makes sense. And then you mentioned Dave Risky. Dave Risky might say, hey, well, I did this out of the bullpen. 
and this kid is in the bullpen, like that's going to help him. So it kind of just kind of comes for full circle with all that. And I love that David Risky in, in particular, because he talked about coming up with a different group of, of players that some guys, I mean, we read about them in books. I mean, I remember watching them play, but I can't imagine sharing a bullpen with some of the guys that he was talking about and being that, and I'm listening to you guys as a fly on the wall, but being a fly on the wall to that, you know, group before, you know, really like your era of, of player came in. I mean, those were like, those were a way different type of player <laughs> than I think we could see today. And, and it's really cool to see how he adapted right away because he knew what his role was going to be. And he just tried to be the best he could coming out of a bullpen. Yeah. Like he shares, you know, Hey, I learned my cutter from Mariano Rivera. Yeah. You know? <laughs> just randomly like, in the outfield. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like he seems to, every team is pissed off. Like, dude, why are you teaching all these other teams your cutter? Like that's, yeah. that's how we're winning. So yeah, it's just interesting how, you know, even as a player standing in the outfield, all the players in the bullpen are having their conversations and doing their thing. And and even myself, that would have been great to have, you know, an idea of what they're talking about, too. Now, you talking. You mentioned your first round draft pick, 1995. I just want to read off some of the names that came out of this first round. I mean, because it is it is unbelievable the, the amount of talent that was in this first round. Uh, Darren Erstad, Ben Davis, Jose Cruz Jr., Todd Helton, Jeff Jenkins, Roy Halladay, Kerry Wood, Matt Morris, yourself, obviously. Being in that draft class and getting prepared for that 1995 draft, what is going through your brain at that point? Do you know you're going in the first round? Do you have you met with anybody? What is going on in Chad Hermanson's head uh, the night of the uh, the 1995 baseball draft? Yeah, it's well. I guess I could compare it to what what we do now, where back then you might have one, two, three teams that are really interested, <clears throat> and they would actually have people fly in and do a workout with you. Um, so Pittsburgh, <coughs> excuse me, was actually the only team that had their people come in. I did a workout at my high school. Um, they were they were impressed. I did my thing, and they're like, "Yeah, we're we're very interested in you." They didn't necessarily the first round, but you know you can kind of get a sense like we're interested in you for that pick. And then of course your agents talking to different teams. Um, from my understanding, uh, if you remember Reggie Taylor, you know you're a Philly mm-hmm. guy. Uh, my understanding, it kind of came down to between me and Reggie at that pick. And, and of course, they went with me. But Reggie, Reggie Taylor was a great outfielder. He was one of the top outfielders in the country that year. Um, but, yeah, you kind of have an idea. You have a feeling going into um, going into your senior season. Scouts start to come and visit you. you know, that's what I do now. Those top prospects in, in the area, as a scout, you got to go visit with the parents and with the player get to know them, kind of get a sense for who they are. And so if that's starting to happen for you your senior year and you're getting 15, 20 teams coming in, you're, you're, a, you're a top prospect. You know, So it's, it's one of those things where uh, you, you take a look at that and you're like, okay, I guess I need to really do my thing on the field, but it looks like I'm a prospect for this draft. Um, but I, you know, somehow I, I, was, I was a young kid. I was 17 when I was drafted. I had a late birthday in September. So – I, I get I was able to handle it, you know, and that's and I kind of when I go in and talk to kids from my perspective now, you get a sense for who can handle it, who is ready. Um, you know, if they went out to pro ball now, they would get eaten alive. You know, mm-hmm. some of them and just college right. is sometimes better, uh, you know, an option. So you, you, and that's that's kind of one thing why I try to do with the local kids here in Vegas as I help with the scout team in the fall is get a sense for who they are, what they're all about. Um, if they have a 0 for 15, you know, what's their reaction to that? Are they, do they bury themselves, you know, or are they actually, oh, I can handle this. I can make adjustments. Um, Cause when you start to go into pro ball, you know, it's like you're facing the, if you're going to college, you're facing the PAC 12 Friday starter, Friday, Saturday, Sunday type guy. You know, that's what you're seeing in pro ball every day. So, you know, can they hit, if it's a hitter, can he, can he hit those guys or do they just dominate them? So those are all the things that you kind of look at, but, but yeah, no, go that that draft class was, you know, I looked at it, at it the other day because I was looking, doing some things on my st- side, and I was like, dude, there were some really good players in this draft. 
It really, no, it really is. Now we don't see it televised back then like we do now at MLB Network Studios, and you have each team there, and it's really turned into the NFL draft. What was the night like for you itself? Kind of paint the picture for us because uh, they didn't televise it the way they did uh, now back back in. I think they started doing that around 2010 ish, but back in '95, much much different situation. Yeah, it was uh, it was a normal night the night before, and then we had a draft party at my house. Um, had some friends over. My girlfriend, who is now my wife, <laughs> I had right. a high school <laughs> card, She was there. Um, then all there's about three or four different news stations that were here, and yeah, so everything was a phone call. So you're kind of having some dialogue back and forth between you know basically just me and my agent, my advisor, and. I just remember like, hey, you know, the draft had started. I think my agent called me around like the fifth or sixth pick that happened. And he was basically just saying, hey, I, I think it's going to be Pittsburgh. <clears throat> and I'm like, okay, cool. And and then kind of getting the terms like, hey, how, how it went down for me is, um, if you remember Jarrett Wright, yep. he, he was the 10th pick the year before uh, by the Indians. And they basically said, hey, the tenth pick last year got this amount. Would you accept this amount? You know, and it, it's seven figures. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> where where do I sign? Right? Like, come on. You know. So, but you know, you know, I wanted to play pro ball. Um, I wanted to start right away. So I I was all in at that point. And um, yeah, it just kind of happened. And my agent called me and said, he's, I think it was about the ninth pick. Um, I think it was Jeff Jenkins who went before me, if I'm not mistaken, with the Brewers. Obviously, an amazing pick. And uh, yeah, he's, he calls, he's like, hey, they're going to be the Pirates. And then, you know, they get on the horn and they make the selection and and that's what happened. Was it the Pirate <laughs> Parrot that made the call? Did they they try to goof one on you? <laughs> yeah, that would have been cool. Uh, no, was, uh, <laughs> my agent called to, to let me know. And then uh, if I remember correctly, it was Cam Bonifay, the GM at that time, called me. Yeah. Pirates are in an interesting position at that point because they're a few years off of dominating for three, four years, and then they would kind of start the tailspin that they've really still kind of been in since about the mid-90s, uh, where it seems like they're always rebuilding and they're always fostering these great players that end up going someplace else. And the team that you came into eventually when you made your your debut, I'll get to I'll get to that in a few minutes, but the team you were coming into itself was sort of still in a rebuilding mode, just coming off of those glory years of the mid nineties. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, we had, you know, bonds had, had just left at that point um, a little bit earlier, you know, the killer bees, they were kind of all um, Jay bell was still there. I remember being a shortstop prospect. I remember having a conversation with Jay bell. Um, so kind of all those big stars essentially were kind of on their way out. Um, Jim Leland was still there. And then, um, I can't remember what year Gene Lamont came on, but yeah, so it, it was, you could, I remember the, the term was rebuild, right? They're constantly rebuilding. Um, and then they wanted to bring guys like, you know, Ramirez, um, uh, Abraham Nunez, Chris Benson, Warren Morris, kind of all those names. Um, that's who they, you know, the Pirates envisioned would be their future. Um, you know, and of course I was a part of that, so. Yeah, a guys yeah. that you basically came through the minor leagues with would be that core from basically around 99 till about mid 2003 ish. Uh, but talk about the minor leagues, because I have a fascination with the, the minor leagues and how the trips are, the bus trips, you know, the, the older stadiums at that point, too, especially it was before a lot of these glamorous minor league stadiums uh, <laughs> came about. There's still a lot that are not glamorous, but back then it was not these, you know, massive Yankee Stadium like uh, presentations you see at some minor league ballparks talk about your first impressions of the minor leagues and, and did it kind of did it live up to expectations or was it below what you thought of uh, being a major or being a baseball player a pro ball player was well i remember going to rookie ball you know i'm 17 years old i'm i'm, I'm in vegas i'm going across the country as far as you can go to florida um so I'm, I'm really on my own for the first time which that i was cool with that like, you know, I, I was ready to you know i felt like i was mature enough to handle that and move on and um, but I remember, you know, going to rookie ball, you had your practice in the morning and then you, yeah, you batting, you did all your thing in the, in the morning for a few hours. Then you came in, <clears throat> had your lunch, you know, and then you play your game at about two in the afternoon, roughly in, in Florida, 
And when you're from Vegas going to the East Coast like that, you being in Virginia, that's a whole different kind of heat, right? <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's just draining. So, so getting used to the weather, that was one thing. But then just the longevity of how the day went, how long it was, you know, like, holy cow. And then you do it day, day after day and just repeat and repeat and repeat. You're like, this is, uh, this is a job. You know, this is, this is, uh, it was fun. You know, you're, you're meeting all these new guys and you're playing games. Uh, but it was hard, you know, and it was I, I could not wait to get out of rookie ball. And at that time, Erie, Pennsylvania was our yeah. short season 18. And so I couldn't wait to get there. Not, not a glamorous place. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but but it, it was fun because you, you you had that seven o'clock game now. You know, now you're on the regular minor league schedule where right. now you, you get to the ballpark later. Your games are at seven. You know, you're playing now in front of people human beings, <laughs> rookie <laughs> ball, not so much. It's just kind of a uh, parent here or there that's visiting. Uh, but it was, it was, it was the, the grind now of that minor league every, every day activity. And, uh, but the minor leagues was great. You know, it was, um, I think there's stuff that you don't miss now as an older person. Like if, you know, people are, Hey, why did you become a coach or a hitting coach? I'm like, you know, those bus rides that are 10, 12 hours long all through the night. Like I don't miss those whatsoever. Um, but when you're 17, 18, 19 years old, those were fun. You know, you're, you're with your, your guys, your buddies, you're young, your body can handle it for the most part. Um, you can handle all these different sleep schedules, but, uh, but yeah, I think when, when I talk to guys now, you know, that that's the one thing you miss the most is just hanging out with the guys, the coaches, being in the, the locker room, all the stories you share. Um, and the baseball is, is great, but it, in a way, it's kind of second nature sometimes. But it's and it comes, it always comes back to the people. Who in the pirate system at that point was like your go-to person for either advice or they were the one giving you your next steps uh, on what you're going to be doing? Was it an, an roving instructor? Was it more of a management position? Who was like one person that would be your go-to guy? Well, you know that's that's a great question. I, I, I think for the most part, managers, coaches would kind of would leave me alone you know one thing that i haven't really talked about was you know i was a shortstop in the in the pirates unless they're like i was an, always an outfielder right when i got to the Pirates, so I, I went from becoming a shortstop to moving to the outfield um on the mental side of the game i had huge anxiety playing shortstop right. um, i could throw the ball really hard um my arm always hurt every single day for whatever reason <laughs> I, we 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 were heavy benchers in high school. My, <laughs> my shoulder to this day is jacked up. Um, but we, we, would, we were heavy weightlifters in that regard. Like I could bench 300 pounds as a 17 year old, right? And I'm like, well, what, how is that going to help me with throwing the ball from short? And that's why I can't lift my arm to this day. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hard for me to do that. But, there you go. <laughs> but like Jeff Bannister was a big guy for me, Trent Jewett, you know, all, all the managers would have. They, they would share things with you that were, you know, maybe it's personal, um, but they were constantly helping you. But, yeah, I mean, I went through my whole shortstop where I, I just struggled to throw the ball to first base, you know. Right. Um, whether you call that the thing, um, the monster, whatever it is, I, I had that. And that's right. I just had enough of it from short after making a lot of errors. You know? and, it, and the game came, it wasn't fun for me at, at that point. And I remember going to, uh, so this was in double A, Mark Hill, uh, Booter Hill was our manager. And I, I basically went to him like, hey, and I'm 19 years old. I'm like, like this is not fun for me. Like I, I'm, I'm doing early work, you know, a couple days a week. I'm doing what I can. All I can think about from the mental side, not throwing the ball away. And, and it just ate at me. And so that was kind of my first form of the mental side of the game where I was constantly worried about what other people thought of me, um, trying to live up to these expectations of this number one draft pick. Um, and I, I beat myself up. You know, I, I was pretty even kill um, when I played. I didn't really show a lot of emotion. That's just kind of who I am. But when I went home, it was it was rough, you know. And so I kind of finally said, like, dude, if I'm going to keep playing this game because I love to hit, I, I love to play, and I know if I went to center field, I would love this game even more. Um, so that's what I requested to to move to the outfield. Uh, let me let me do show off my speed. I'm not a finesse guy with my throws. I'm more of a chucker. <laughs> that, that, that's going to play better in the outfield. 
And, but yeah, I kind of, I had, I had shoulder, I ended up hurting my shoulder. Um, in fact, the, the only in 2002 was the only year I was in the big leagues the whole year started the year on the PL. I had a torn labrum at that time. Oh, wow. And so I, I had a, a couple shots to kind of get me through the year. And then I got traded to the Cubs, you know, that, uh, uh, that trading deadline. Right. But, uh, yeah, I sort of tore, tore my labrum and, uh, in the scouting world now, you know, if you tear a labrum and a shoulder, that's that's not good, right? So it's it, there's just something about the shoulder that it's, it's really hard to get over. So you know, elbows, Tommy John, uh, people are having more success with that. But but no, I, I had my my guys that I would look at, and and you kind of rely a lot on your players, your teammates, you know, when, when you're talking about things, and um, and that's kind of what I wanted to get at was. I wish players would be more open to discussing what their failures are. You know, at the time you're you're in it, right? You're like, dude, I'm I'm gonna you're gonna get through every obstacle which you are, but to just be more open with the dialogue, with the conversation, and and I I never had that, you know, in in pro ball with other players. So that's that's something I wish would have been talked about. Yeah, in some regard, toughness could be a weakness because when you're trying to portray that that outer toughness and you're nursing the arm and you're, you've got these decisions making you're a number one pick. You want to live up to the investment the team is making in you for you to give them the suggestion of possibly moving you. Is that something that they then take from you, go in a room, come out and say, all right, you're heading out there. Or do they like really mull this over and figure out, is this the best move? Like not just for right now, but for the long term of you, the team and everybody involved. Yeah, my, my first initial, so in double A, when I said, hey, I put me in center field. And they they agreed. They, you know, next day I'm in center field. Oh, wow. And then, I, then I play, you know, I think they're like, okay, dude, we got to do <laughs> yeah. he's, our, he's our top guy. We got to put him where he wants to go type thing. Um, so I, I actually felt bad because my roommate, um, Jeff Conger, was one of our outfielders. Um, that put him to the bench. You know, so I kind of felt bad about that, but that's – kind of how life works out sometimes, <laughs> but, right. um, but yeah, I went to center field immediately. I played there for a majority of the season and then they came back to me and said, Hey, what about second base? And, and I'm like, like, dude, I'm, I already have trouble throwing from shortstop. I bet second base is going to be even worse. So as you can imagine what I just told you, I already had the mindset of this is not going to work out. Right. I, because I, I believed I was not an infielder, so right. it kind of it kind of just manifested itself. I, I there were times when I had really good confidence playing there, and then there were other times it's just like, you know, because I like when you throw from the infield, like it's all different angles, you know. And then my like I said, my shoulder hurt like every single day. I'm like when I tried to drop down, it it was so painful. I'm like, I got to do this every day, you know. And when I was able to get it up, it didn't hurt. So. Yeah. It was kind of one of those things where, like, well, am I going to play in pain every day or can I just go to the outfield and kind of live freely, get rid of all these negative thoughts I'm having and just go out and play? And doing it at that point in your development is key because you see how guys get moved while they're up, uh, you know, on the, the big squad. And there's disasters. I mean, even star players that move from, you know, you see a guy, a guy that you were traded with. Todd Hundley was a catcher with the Mets. Well, when they acquired Mike Piazza, they still wanted to keep the Todd Hundley bat in the lineup. So he moves to the outfield when he comes up from his, or come back from his injury. And that was a disaster. So yeah. it's good to do that in the development stages rather than do it when you get up there, because now, you know, okay, maybe if we need somebody to come in in an emergency, you can come back into the infield, but let's get you prepared out there to, to get <laughs> those chucks ready for when you play in the outfield. Yeah. When I, when I see guys that you, they always say that you can always move from the dirt to the outfield, which I, I agree with. I think the infield is, it's a whole different animal, uh, different skill sets, you know, things of that nature. So when a lot of times they'll put a catcher or even a first base, they'll just, Hey, let's just move into left field. I always cringe at that because at the big league level, you know, balls are getting hit so hard and you got to have athleticism. You got to have that reaction time, you know, the quick twitch and, and those guys, that's not really who they are. So I can imagine a guy like Todd Hundley, who I played with, He's probably like, are you kidding me? Like, yeah, that. <laughs> I'm just going to go play left field. It's going to be easy, right? It's it's like, um, what was it, Scott Hatterberg, 
in uh in that in the movie um what's that brad pitt movie called uh, moneyball moneyball right so what it was it uh ron washington when they're in the house how how hard is it to move to first base it's extremely hard right <laughs> so it's just a whole different game at that level the speed of everything and and when we talk about it with as a scout hey you know he's probably not a third baseman but we could easily move him to, to left field right and i'm kind of yeah, we could, but th does he still have the athleticism, the quickness, and all the the quick twitch and the range to be able to perform? The range, with, right. That's what I was going to say, the range, because that's yeah. a big deal. Your range in the infield is much different than your range in the outfield because the trajectory of the ball is different when you're in the outfield. Yeah, I, I think when you see teams that have, you know, base, essentially three center fielders playing all three outfield spots, you know, that, right. that's a big – to me, that's a big league outfield. Yeah. You know, you got, and then you got guys that are, you know, being in, in Vegas here, we got Joey Gallo, who's a monster that is sometimes playing center field, you know, and you're like, and I, I happen to actually coach Joey his senior year at Bishop Gorman. Oh, wow. You know, and he's about 6'5 in high school, probably about 215-ish, somewhere around there. Just <laughs> a big dude, right? A big boy. And now he's like 240, 250, you know, <laughs> but he's still athletic enough and can run to 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 kind of have a little bit of center field play in him, but ideally as a corner outfielder, I think he's going to be in right field this year. Right. Um, but yeah, that's that's at the big league level, you got to have athletic guys out there. Yeah, absolutely. I want to fast forward a little bit. I want to get to your MLB debut because I, I love these stories. And this is the question I always ask when we talk about the MLB debut. It's not just you know when you got the call and you're going to come up. You know that's a great story. We you can throw that one in there. But my question when we make the MLB debut is who's the first person you meet when you get to the stadium? Now, the, the, your MLD, MLB debut, Pirates, Padres. That's a great question. Um, I just remember, so, I mean, that was that was Three River Stadium, right? So that was, it's a big, huge stadium. You're, you're in awe. Um, you already know the players somewhat because you spend a little bit of time with them in big league camp. You know, and you played a couple games. Uh, but I just know going in, like, I, I don't remember who was the first person I saw. I just remember walking in. Um, it might have even been if Greg Johnson, you know, that that took us in there, kind of handled our finances, would give us our checks and stuff. And right. like, like, here's your locker. <laughs> um, but I, I do remember going to the locker, um, you know, just kind of smiling, not like, – I'm going to be quiet. I'm a quiet guy anyway in regards to the – having respect for the older players, you know, cause I knew at that, at that time in the game, it wasn't loud and boisterous. You knew you had to know your place. Like you're a rookie dude. You don't say anything, just shut up, put your head down and go do your job. And so I, I was pretty good at that. <laughs> so, so Gene Lamont's the manager at the time. Does he come and meet you? Do you go to meet him? Do they organize the, the first presentation of the starting left fielder in your MLB debut? Yeah, I think, um, you just walk into the office, kind of the handshake. Hey, how's it going? Very, you know, Gene Lamont was not, he didn't talk a lot to me, if, to be frank. Um, I, I remember it was just kind of a, hey, what's up, Herm? You know, that kind of thing. And um, I, I, f I found that kind of odd, you know, the lack of communication at, at that. Like, to me, you bring up a rookie that, yeah, maybe you, you want him to be comfortable, right? Especially right. you're trying to help him win help a team win. And so, um, so you kind of quickly kind of get to know like, okay, like this is, this is pure business. Go and do your job, get your work done, do your thing and then just go home. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a cordial handshake. Welcome to the big leagues type thing. And you're in the starting lineup tonight. And um, I remember then going out of the office and then had the first time, you know, maybe six to 10 reporters that were at my locker I uh, wanted to ask questions and and kind of so it all kind of started from there. Do you remember the starting pitcher for the Padres that evening? Uh, yes, it was uh, Sterling Hitchcock. That's right. Yeah, my, so, my, my, my I remember vividly my first at bat because um, I, I believe I was in eight that game and Reggie Sanders is playing left field and I smoke a ball to left field um, and he you know Reggie Sanders as fast as can be. Gets over there in a heartbeat, snow cones the ball. You know, what would have been a stand-up double, would have one-hopped the wall. 
and I'm rounding first base. And I'm like, this dude caught that ball? You know? <laughs> um, but I do remember, like, so that happened. And then I came back and I actually, I actually got a standing ovation. Um, and I, and I kind of joke around. I was like, yeah, it's probably the only standing ovation I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> the expectation started here. <laughs> and then Reggie Sanders put a uh, big crimp in those plans. Yeah. Well, I, I, it was kind of cool. Cause I, you know, many years later, almost 20 years later, I was able to go back to the MLB draft in New York and Reggie was there representing the Royals and our teams right next to each other in the draft room in that MLB studio. And I had to go up to him. I'm like, Reggie, like, I got a story to tell you, you know, and I told him, like, dude, you ruined my career. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that, yeah, the, the double off the wall to start the career would yeah. be amazing. I'm like, dude, I would have went one for one. Things would have taken off for me. So just kind of having some fun with it. He's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. You know, he's like, hey, man, this is the big leagues. Like, you got to make those plays, you know. And um, But that was kind of cool to have that experience and, and kind of share that with him. I'm like, dude. I'm like, you've been in my nightmares for 20 years, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would take till game number four for you to get that first hit. So where's the ball? I mean, is it on the mantle behind you? Where's where's the baseball from your first hit? Yeah, no, I gave that to my dad. Um, oh, very nice. Yeah, my my parents were always, you know, kind of kind of parents that never missed a game. You know, they they always supported me with everything I did, and and uh, yeah, so I, I'm not a big guy for keeping my. I don't have jerseys on the wall, and and everything about me, you know, it's, I kind of, I kind of keep that separate in a way and kind of just in my own mindset and stuff like that. But, but yeah, I gave this to my dad and he has it on his wall in his house. Well, very nice. Was it a relief to get that first hit off the schneid and, and kind of put it behind you and now let's get to work? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. So that, that was against the Cardinals and uh, versus Jose Jimenez, if I remember correctly. And Mark McGuire's at first base, you know, and this is in 99. So yeah. <laughs> he just so he, I mean, he's the guy, right? And and I'm I'm like six two. He's six five, just a monster. I I get my hit round first base, <laughs> come back to first base, and you know the trainer's like, hey, we want the ball, you know, throw us the ball. And McGuire's like, first hit, huh, kid? And I look at him, up at him, like, yeah, yeah, man. yeah. He's like, that's awesome. And so I was able to, you know, it was actually so my wife is an artist. Um, she did portraits and stuff. Yeah. And part of her uh, her college graduation, I guess you could say, was painting about ten different people. And she did a painting of McGuire. Oh wow! And we we ha she happened to have these with us, and I was able to send it over to him. He signed it for us. Oh, awesome! Um, so that was really cool. So yeah, that was a that was a pretty cool moment. You make the turn, and then there's a building standing right behind you, and you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, this guy plays fire. baseball? Like, this guy's enormous. And that's, you know, again, like I was saying before, you know, that your draft class is unbelievable, but then, you know, your first game, you're playing against Tony Gwynn. Your second series, you're playing against Maguire and the Cardinals, and, and in the year that the Cardinals would end up, you know, they, they were in a huge uh, move at that point. You know, it was it's a, an interesting time to jump in, but what I mentioned before about the Pirates, it's kind of like the transition between – that mid nineties to the early two thousands. And you still have Al Martin and Kevin Young and guys that were a part of the nineties regime still there on their way out. What was the, the vibe like of the team? Was it a transition mode? Was it a rebuilding? Did you feel the young blood starting to come through a little bit? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I, I had a ton of, you know, a ton of respect for Al Martin, you know, and I, I wish I would have been able to play with him more. Um, the one thing I personally wish is I see this happening um, you know, being an angel, for example, got Mike Trout that has come up as the great, greatest player could possibly, you know, best game player in the game right now, right? Absolutely. Um, he had guys like Tory Hunter, um, Albert Pujols to, to kind of help him and mold him and ask questions. Um, that was what I personally felt was lacking. And whether it was because I didn't ask and, and I wasn't comfortable, uh, but I wish I would have been able to, I guess, be more open and upfront with going to ask guys like that questions, you know, uh, going to lunch, you know, going to dinner. And um, because what I, what I had found, and, and this is kind of a story I, I share with the kids that I coach and teach um, where this is the year 2000 and we're in Cincinnati and I'm playing center field. And, you know, when you have a pitching change, outfielders, they, they converge, they talk while, while the, while the pitching change is happening. And 
one of the players who I looked up to, you know, I, I'm probably I'm hitting below 200 and I'm, I'm about to actually get sent down just a few days later. And I asked one of our players, I go, hey, dude, I I'm struggling here, man. Like, you got anything for me? Like any any words of advice, anything you got for me? And he just kind of gave me a look like, like, I got nothing for you, dude. Like, <laughs> figure it out. Um, so I kind of took that. I'm like, wow. Like I, I guess I'm kind of on my own. Um, so I, I, I to be frank, I kind of lost at this so a little bit of respect for this player. I'm like, dude, we're trying to win here. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm opening up to you. I need some help. Like you got any advice? And he just kind of shrugged his shoulders. And I'm not going to name a name or anything, but right. I was. It was very disappointing. I'm like, is this how it is with this team? Like, is it? it we're not helping each other out. It's all about yourself. Um, so. I, I kind of saw that a little bit happening and, um, and I, and it's just, I guess it's unfortunate. Yeah. And it's real unfortunate, but you see it now. It seems a little different. It seems like guys are a little more open to, to discussion and taking guys under their wing. And, you know, with your whole program, it seems like this is the, you guys saw the errors. You know what I mean? You guys saw that your generation saw the changes that needed to be made and you're making them. And I think that's where a lot of debates come between, you know, modern baseball, old school baseball, the kind of starts and it starts and ends with what you're just saying. Yeah. People needed to be a little bit more, more open and you never know. I mean, it could have been something that they told you that you took on for the rest of your life, but instead you kind of got the, uh, the cold shoulder and moved on with your business. Well, in one, one thing that, so I, I just did an interview on my show with Jeff Bannister um, and Banny's, I, I mean, talk about just an amazing human being. Jeff Bannister is, is it, you know, he's one of the guys I look up to. I wish I was able to hang around him more, uh, even play for him as a manager in the big leagues. Cause you always knew he had your back. Um, right. And he, he just said what you said. He's like, yeah, a lot has changed. You know, he, he was the manager for in Texas for four years. And he's, you know, he's like, he goes, I've learned from what you had to go through um, with us not really being able to help you essentially. Yeah. He's like, things have changed now. We, we've opened up more. We're, we're more open to listening to people and what they're going through. And w just when you, when you have that and you know, like, Hey, dude, if I, and I think the biggest thing, the hiccup to get over is regarding mental skills coaches is they're, they're actually, they're performance coaches. So a lot of times you don't like, we go to a hitting coach to work with our hitting pitching goes to pitch. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have something wrong with you to go and talk to a mental skills coach, right? It's more right. about what do we got to do to get you back on track? If there's psychological issues, you know, then maybe you go talk to a psychologist and we can kind of work together on, Hey, what's a plan that we can form to make this work for you? Right. Now, before we start to get into the wrap up and we'll talk about all that one more time before we, uh, we finish up just moving from your home organization originally of the pirates, then you go to the Cubs. Just tell me about what that change is like from the organizational standpoint of having to learn a new organization. No matter how long you're there for, you're with the Pirates organization for a good, you know, almost, what, six, seven years. That By the time you move over, you're with the Cubs. How is it kind of integrating into a new organization in, in a way yeah. a new organization does things? Well, yeah, when I, when I got traded to the Cubs, I, I was – it was a really interesting – situation where I was at because I, I mean, I was told that I was going to be the everyday center fielder and I felt like w once I had a bad game, then I, I sat the bench for two or three games, you know? So I, I kind of felt like for the first time ever in my career, I, like minor leagues there, I knew I was playing every right. And then I got up to the big leagues where, and of course you got to perform, you got to go out right. every day. But for the first time in my life, if I went over four, I was going home that night, like crap, I might not play tomorrow. Right. So I, I kind of had those thoughts and negative feelings. Um, and so when I got traded, I was actually happy. Um, I was like, this is not working out. Um, I feel like the people here are not helping me at all. So I was actually excited for the change. And I remember John Parado, who I became close with, he actually said, he's like, man, I've never seen someone so excited to get traded. Um, <laughs> and, and really, it was, it was just time for a change, you know, and right. it wasn't working out. I felt horrible. You know, I was like, dude, I wanted to make it work so bad here in Pittsburgh. Um, and that's probably my downfall because I wanted it so bad that I just tried too hard. 
And and then when I went to Chicago, I was like, sweet, there's a I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a new atmosphere. It's Chicago, great city. Um, and then I get there and I noticed right away, and they say what winning cures all ills, right? It's it there was just a different atmosphere. Everyone was loose. Um, and then I realized quickly, I'm like, oh crap, I'm really not gonna play here. Cause I look over and I got Moises Alou and left, Corey yeah. Patterson in center, and a guy named Sammy Sosa in right. And yeah. then we, we had one of the best um, fourth outfielders in the game, Roosevelt Brown, a good friend of mine. Um, so I'm like, okay, I, I realized real quickly, I'm like, I'm probably going to only be maybe a defensive replacement. I, I'm going to legitimately be that fourth or fifth outfielder, maybe start against some lefties. Um, and that's exactly what happened. In fact, my first start uh, with the Cubs was against Randy Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> that's got to be a good feeling, huh? Stepping in the box the first after seeing what he did to the bird. I'm sure that's a pretty pretty good yeah. feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was there for over a month, I think, and I hadn't started yet. Um, so I I was adapting. I was learning that new routine of okay, I know I'm not going to start. Now I gotta I gotta do things differently, prepare differently. Um, so I was able to pick that up pretty quick. And then we were in Arizona. Um, and Bruce Kim, who was the in, in, interim manager at that time, Dusty Baker just got let go. He comes up to me in the outfield while I was taking some fly balls, and he taps me on the shoulder. He's like, Herm, Herm, you got a, you got the big unit tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I figured that. Yeah, I figured that because Corey Patterson's left-handed, and he didn't want right. him facing him. So, But, yeah, so you you had to adapt and learn those things. But but I did notice it was a different atmosphere. Um, that, that team was winning. You know, this was the uh, 2002, so – and I spent what August and September uh, with the Cubs that year. So, um, and that was I was just a complete mess physically. That that's when I learned. I learned later that off season I had a torn labrum, um, which in it made my all the pain in my shoulder was making my neck. Like I'd wake up in the morning every morning. I'd wake up and I couldn't turn. You know, so I was I was having a lot of pain there, and then all of a sudden my big toe. In my right foot started to just ache and throb. Like it felt like a knife was in there. Um, so I, I, I eventually ended up having two surgeries. I had labrum surgery that winter. Um, and then it was just, it, that never really got better. I, I was able to play in the big leagues with a couple other teams, the Dodgers and the Blue Jays after that. Um, but it was awful. I, I could barely, it was hard to even throw. Um, and so I, but I just dealt with it somehow. Then I had a foot surgery. Um, and then, yeah, so basically after I even left the pirates, it was kind of a, a pretty fairly quick down downfall of not really playing much in the big leagues anymore. I think that was that Yinzer curse. They must've put on you on the way out as you were crossing the bridge to, uh, to leave. They, they cursed you, uh, before we do get into the final plugs and to talk about your, uh, you know, your, your coaching and all the stuff, the great stuff that you're doing, just a few rapid fires. Who's the toughest pitcher you faced? Let's leave Randy Johnson out of it. Toughest pitcher. Oh man, I was going to go right to him. No, um, no, no. We're taking him out. You already said him. We can't say him twice. <laughs> I mean, Maddox. I, I was able to face Maddox. I, I had a little bit of success on him, but his ball moved more than anybody's. He he would, as a right-handed hitter, the ball he would throw, they would tail back across that outside corner. You're like, that's three feet outside, and then it comes back and it's for a strike. <laughs> You're like, so Greg Maddox. And you don't want to hit anything back up the box because he's going to field it. So that's the yeah. other. That's the other one. How about somebody you had a lot of success off of? Yeah, ironically, I, I hit the Cubs pitchers really well. I think that's probably why they ended up trading for me. <laughs> <laughs> so collectively, the Cubs. Probably the Cubs. Yeah. How about biggest prankster you played with? Man, um, that's that's a good question. I don't remember a lot of pranks going on. Um, none maybe brian giles he was he was more goofy and would you know walk around the clubhouse naked sometimes and just kind of be <laughs> kind of be funny you know in that sort of, sort of sense funniest moment you had on the field wow um i would say funniest would be mo maybe most embarrassing um i was in double a and i was playing shortstop and it was kind of at right at the beginning of a, a game. The ball gets smoked to me, and I, and I never even saw it off the bat. And it hit my shin. Like, it literally hit my right shin. 
and it it's skidded off to down the like it would have been the third base foul line, and I'm just on the ground in pain. Like if you ever fouled a ball off your shin, um, you know how bad that hurts, and that it was so embarrassing. And I was able to stay in the game, get up and everything, but I'm like, I'm like, what just happened there? You know, and and the guy got a double out of it, so that was pretty embarrassing. First thought of what you want to say to the umpire after a called third strike. You're ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you, sir? <laughs> and then, this is a good last one. First home run. What's the feeling? Oh, man. I, in, it was in Chicago against the Cubs. Um, Andrew Lorraine, who ended up being a teammate of mine, um, hit it to left field. It hit the back of uh, the wall where you got, the, you got the home run fence at Wrigley Field and then that top fence. Right. Hit that fence. They threw the ball back on, or at least we thought it was the real ball. They kind of switched those at Wrigley at times. Um, but that was an incredible feeling. You know, you're rounding first and second. You're like, dude, I just hit a homer. Uh, my wife and mother-in-law were like the only Pirate fans there, I think, going nuts. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so that was a pretty special moment for us. No, very, very cool. All right, so like we said before, mentaledge.training is the website. <laughs> All the information and all the great stuff Chad was talking about early in the interview uh, is on there. A great overview, some ins and outs of, of what he does provide and some of the services, but uh, also the YouTube series and the interviews with former players and coaches and people that can kind of give you their mental edge. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Share with us more information, uh, what we can find, uh, any other social media you have and where uh, the listeners can uh, kind of reach out and touch and see what else is going on in your world. Yeah, it's it's just uh, like you mentioned the the new handle is Mental Edge Training Coach. Uh, that's the YouTube channel. I I just I've had my my Instagram and Facebook personal stuff going on, but I've just added those, um, you know, on all the social media accounts. And um, yeah, and, you know, regarding the what I I do encourage the young players and even the parents that say have kids in in that little league age to high school, maybe even to college, um, sign up for the free course, you know, because they It'll give you an idea. I do four videos. Um, I talk about, you know, developing routines and, and having good positive habits. Talk about pr procrastination. And I give a, a scout's view on, you know, what are we looking for in pitchers and hitters? Uh, just overall, it gives you an idea of, of how I how I communicate, how I do the, the teachings. And it just gives you an introduction to my actual course. Um, so it's four videos and I offer you to join my membership course. Uh, the membership courses, it's a membership. It's yearly. It's going to be $199 for the whole year. And it's a video per week. So 52 videos. I'll update the videos as we go along. And what you'll be able to do, your your son, your daughter, they'll be able to have interaction with me uh, through email. Um, I'll probably, I might start eventually doing Zoom calls with teams, you know, to kind of do some introduction there. Uh, but that's my whole goal is I want to help these kids individually, um, help them build their self-image, their self-confidence, and just to know that they have somebody to go to like I really didn't have when I went through. And that's what's really cool about it. It's really uh, – and that's the great thing about all the innovation we've got these days. There's new ways to do things, and you've really found a great niche for yourself. And uh, I've really enjoyed watching the videos and, and kind of getting to see your philosophy and, and obviously the stories today. I, I really appreciate it. And also, uh, please, any social media handles that you have that you can share with the listeners. Yeah, so my – it's at Chad Hermanson. Is, I'm kind of on all the social medias there. And then at Mental Edge Training Coach <clears throat> is all the other ones. So, yeah, that's where you'll find me on my YouTube channel and everything. Yeah, absolutely. Check out the YouTube channel. And if you want to follow me, it's at Chad EMB on Twitter. And for the show, it's at Diamond Conver uh, that at excuse me, at Diamond Convo. I just changed it recently myself. So I'm getting to remember that one. So uh, I appreciate you coming on today, Chad. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate the stories. And I look back down uh, memory lane at your career and uh really appreciate the time maybe we'll do it again sometime yeah absolutely and i really appreciate your time too thanks for the opportunity